In the arid and strife-torn Middle East, land of Bible adventures, wars, camels, and kings, in the tiny, secluded, and landlocked nation of Nippur, a nation known for its strange customs and ancient mysteries, pompous President al-Dalam, chief magistrate and bearer of the royal scepter, sat and fidgeted at his huge marble desk in the presidential palace. An incredibly wealthy oil sheik, President al-Dalam always wore a long, diamond-studded purple robe, gold rings on his fingers, and a very impressive silk turban on his head. He loved being his country's president. He loved being rich. He loved being powerful. Right now, his huge desk was piled with important papers and business of state that needed his official attention. But he couldn't concentrate on any of those things. His mind was too flooded with thoughts of becoming even richer. An excited knock on the big double doors to his office interrupted his daydreams, and a voice called excitedly, "'Mr. President! Manige!' Haldalam had been waiting all morning to hear that rough, raspy voice. "'Gozan! Come in! Come in!' The big doors burst open, and in came Gozan, a bearded, rugged, desert rat of a man." Al-Dalam imagined a small cloud of dust escorting his assistant into the office. Gozan always seemed to have a common man air about him. Gozan removed his big straw hat and made a hurried, oops, I almost forgot, bow. They have arrived, Gozan reported excitedly. The president rose from his desk, arms reaching heavenward in delight. Ah, at last! Dr. Cooper's expedition is finally here! <laughs> now we will see what these Americans are capable of. Tell me, how many men did he bring? Gozan started counting his fingers as he watched faces in his mind. The president was impatient. Well, how many are in the expedition? He must have brought many, perhaps thirty, forty men. Oh, 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 no, my liege, uh, only his children and uh, uh, three workers. Children? The president was obviously unhappy, and that always made Gozan feel a little edgy. Gozan tried to break the news gently. Uh, yes, uh, not small children, mind you, a, a young man and a young lady. Aldalam slammed his fist on his desk and started pacing around the room, his purple robe flowing behind him like a peacock's tail. "'What kind of fool is this, Cooper?' the president fumed. "'Children will only get in the way. They'll get into trouble. I warned him of the dangers.' "'I, I also tried to tell him of the dangers, my liege, but he insists he goes on no assignment without them.' Apparently they are very well trained and can take care of themselves. The president looked intently at Gozan with an expression he usually saved for decreeing death sentences. Gozan bowed, hoping to cool his superior down at least a little. Gozan, this is no task for children. It will take an army, not just four men and two children. Adalam only shook his perplexed head. They will all be killed the first day. The dragon's throat has no mercy. Gozan only shrugged, his eyes rolling. Uh, it will not be the first time, but they must succeed, the president bellowed. Someday, somehow, someone must succeed. Gozan bowed again and stayed bowed for a few moments. He knew that what he was about to say could be risky. Mr. President... Many have tried, and no one has succeeded. Not the German expedition with forty men and heavy machinery. Not the team from France who seemed so bold and confident. The United Nations exploration team couldn't even enter the dragon's throat before half of them were killed by scorpions and cobras. The Swiss expedition vowed never to return. You've sent letters to nations all over the world, but no one will dare to go near the dragon's throat. May my liege live forever. But why did you invite a mere scientist from America and his two young children? What made you think they could succeed where all the others have failed? The president spoke in a lowered voice. I have heard reports about them. I have been told they are fearless.